Good to see you. Got the Christmas lights up. It's December. Means the year's almost over, which might be a good thing. Um, but Christmas is coming, so we got a lot to celebrate. We got a lot to be thankful for. And the good news through all of this, all the changes and, and everything that's going on this year, that one of the things, there, there's just some simple things that just continue to remain true. The career woman in the big city in the Hallmark movie could still find a flight <laughs> to the small town of her youth to save the family business and fall in love with the plumber. It's a beautiful thing. Some things never change. I know, I was excited too. You know what, you wanna know some good news though is that in the Morgan house, we don't get the Hallmark Channel anymore. Yeah, I know, it's awesome. I'm so excited. Turns out Netflix and all those guys, they still have some pretty bad movies out there though. But no Hallmark. All right, so we're going to continue our verse-by-verse uh, -verse study through the book of Matthew, and today I just love how uh, the preaching schedule worked out. Taylor, thank you, because this is, this is one of my favorite pieces of scripture. It's in Matthew 7, and it's the Ask, Seek, Knock. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 7. Let's read it together. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find, and it will be open to you. Knock and it'll be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks, for, asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And I love that, the ending there. The Father in heaven will give good things to those who ask them. So Jesus is asking us to ask and to seek and to knock. And you notice there's, there's three different avenues there. The asking is, is the verbal part of it. It's prayer. The seeking is actually looking for God in, in ways that, that he is active in your life and, and seeking out those answers. And knocking, it's... It's not begging God, it's not anything like that, but it, it's, it's, it's being persistent, showing God what, what matters in your life. And if we could look at the transcripts of your prayer life, what, what would God say, what would we say is important to you? And so Jesus says, ask, seek, and knock. And so we're going to break those down a little bit. And, and so when we talk about ask, and it'll be given to you, this, of course, is, is about prayer. And we're going to ask God what, what we desire in our heart. Uh, and, and we're going to actually have that expectation that he's going to answer. See, we go there. And, and, but one of the things that is really interesting about this piece of scripture here is, is that the truth is, is that there is a part of prayer that's conditional. That we have a part to play. And then God will. So if we, then God. And that's an aspect of, of this prayer that we need to actually make our requests known to God. If we want something, we ask. But what happens if we don't ask? We may not get it. If we want to find God, we've got to go seek. What if we don't seek? What if we stop knocking? And so that is a, it's an important part. And, and actually, James, in the book of James, he kind of shows a different uh, perspective from this verse. If you look at James 4, 2, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So I think a big takeaway from this scripture here this morning that we're going to Matthew is not necessarily just Jesus' command to ask, but the danger that we have with our lack of asking, that, that we actually have a part. And, and so when, when, when James says, you do not have because you do not ask, and I was going through this sermon here this week, uh, a question kind of I was wrestling with is, is, what am I lacking in my life simply because I didn't ask? What, am I, what do I don't have from God because I haven't bothered making that request known? I love this quote from Billy Graham. He says, heaven is full of answers for, to prayers for which no one has ever bothered to ask. 
Are there answers in heaven for you that you have not bothered to ask yet? And God is a giver of good things, good gifts, and he wants to give. But we have to ask. So what am I missing out on? What are, what are you missing out on? Simply because we haven't asked. It's like that scripture, if my people, if my people who are called on my name would humble themselves and pray, if my people. And that's, that's the condition. If we will pray, if we will ask, if we will seek, if we will knock, if we will, we will seek and, and seek the Lord, then he will answer those prayers. But it is a condition that prayer is sometimes conditional. It's if us, then God. If you study for a test, you're going to get a better grade. If you train in the offseason, you're going to be a better athlete. If we ask, God will answer. And so we have a part to play in that. But the problem is, 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 is that sometimes we feel like this, is, this could be a works-based message. Well, I have to do this in order to get God to answer. But it really is the most, one of the most encouraging pieces of Scripture out there. Because it says, Jesus says, if you ask, God will answer you. But I wonder how many of us actually consistently do this. See, we carry with us a lot of wishes. And we carry with us a lot of dreams, a lot of hopes. But do they become askings? And a lot of times we will, we will we'll try to control our own life and, and try to make the best of it with what we have. But all we simply have to do is, is, is go to the Father who loves us and cares for us and has good things for us. He's promised us good things. And if we would just go to him, we'll go to other people and talk, to, talk about our situations in our life. And that's not a bad thing, but do, they ever go, do we ever go to God with those things? And Jesus is here just opening the door wide for us and saying, here is the key to answered prayer. Ask. Don't wish, don't hope, but ask. But sometimes I wonder if we just keep those in because we want to control it. And a lot of times, you know, especially in church, we, we come around and, and we look at the gifts of other Christians and we actually become maybe jealous or, or impressed or wish that we had something that other people have. You know, you see, you, you could go on YouTube and you can see a lot of sermons and say, oh, I wish I had the gift of, of teaching like that. You know, or I wish I had the gift of, of, of being on the worship team, which is personally, I wish I had the gift of being on the worship team. I've tried. It doesn't work. But... There's a, there's a lot of people, like, like even, even, like, you see someone who is, who is evangelizing, who is, who is talking about Jesus to people, and, and you say, I wish I had the courage. I wish I had that. And, and there's something true about, about God gifting each of us with different things. But has it ever occurred to you that a lot of these people that have those giftings is because they asked for them? You know, we don't have to be just, just envious that, that God gave someone this and, and that's not for me. It, it can be for you if you ask. And that's actually been my story. There was, but we, you got to remember, though, that you have to do it with the right intention, with the right attitude. There was a, a you know, a spiritual gift that I was, I was wanting and I never had it and I never had it. And, and I thought, why wouldn't God want to give me this? Well, the truth is I was praying for it. But in the back of my mind and in my heart, the reality was, was that I wanted it because everybody else had it. And I didn't want to be the one out there. And it wasn't until there was a prayer meeting and I was praying and I, and I finally just said, Lord, it doesn't matter if you ever give this to me or not. It doesn't matter who has it, who doesn't. I don't want any roadblocks between me and you. And if this gift will give you honor, then give it to me. And it's not for my glory. And he answered that prayer. But it wasn't until, until I, and I had to ask, but it wasn't until I got out of my mind, I didn't want it in a, in a, a selfish way, but in a way that honors God. But just because that, that you don't have a certain gift or you don't have a certain, certain ability or, or you, you can ask for those and God will answer those, especially if it brings glory to God and not necessary glory to you. 
yeah, I want to be on the worship team. Put me on the worship team. Okay. Do you have any musical ability? Yeah, I have musical ability. Okay, great. We're going to start you, and we're going to put you on guitar, and we're going to put you kind of in the corner there. No, 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 no. I think I should be in the front. And I need to sing, and I need to play guitar, and I want to be there. Well, whose glory are you going after then? But if you're doing it for God, then he will give you the desires of your heart. But that's the key. It has to be in a line with bringing glory to God. See, we need to ask. And, and prayer is not a way that we're going to try to manipulate God to get what we want. But prayer, if we're doing it right, is an avenue of discovery to see what God wants for us. It's, it's not necessarily trying to change the will of God, but it's, it's for our will to be conformed to his. But if we got to be honest, we're looking at a verse that says, ask and it'll be given to you. But God doesn't always answer our prayers, does he? And there are times when, when it just seems like I don't understand why God would not answer this. It just seems like that he should. And it's heartbreaking sometimes. That, that just seems like a no-brainer that why wouldn't God want that? And that's when we have to trust in the sovereignty of God and the goodness of God and know that we don't have all the answers. And so there's a lot of, lot of prayers that we pray that we just don't understand why they're not answered. But if you look at Scripture, there is a lot of prayers that we pray that we understand why God doesn't answer them. And he outlines them in, in Scripture, and we can go over some of them. Why does he not answer some of these prayers? And honestly, the first one is really because we don't know what's best for us. If you look at the scripture here today, it says that, that those who are evil, or the parents who are evil will still give good things to their kids. That if, if a child asks for a bread and, you know, they're not going to give them a snake. And even evil earthly parents will still do that out of love for their kids. You see, sometimes we don't know what we're asking for. We may think it's good, and we may think it's, it's great for us and everything else, but, but, but God understands that what we're really asking for is a snake. And a, and a no is actually a protection for us. I remember, you know, when we were raising Nicole, and she was um, elementary school, and cell phones were like just coming out and she, it was really popular. And of course, all her friends, her high school musical friends all wanted to get together and they watched the movie and they all had their cell phones. And back then, texts cost 10 cents a piece. I don't know if you guys remember, some of them, you got some of you will, some of them you're like 10 cents. No. You send a text, 10 cents. You receive a te text, 10 cents. Not good. So she says, can I have a phone? And I'm thinking, this is not going to go well. And so Brandy and I would actually talk about that. And she said, this is what I'll do. I won't do this, and I won't do this, but I really want it. It's going to be responsible, and it's, it's emergencies. It's like, well, I grew up, I never had an emergency, but that's okay. And so anyway, so she had, she laid, she had a whole plan of, I didn't even think she wrote it out, how, why she should have this phone. And we said no. And to her, it didn't make any sense. Because in her heart and her mind, she would do well with this phone. It would be all, but Brandy and I, we understood that if we give her this phone at this age with her friends and how kids work, we're giving her a snake. And so we said no, even though she didn't understand. And I think we can all agree now that we all have cell phones and sometimes they're snakes, right? But we didn't do that and she didn't understand and God works the same way. There are prayers that God won't answer because they could be snakes. There's other reasons why God doesn't answer prayers. We'll go through a few of them. One is because we pray with an unbelieving spirit. James 1, 6 through 7 says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. We have to pray and be confident in what we're praying for. I'll pray for this job and this promotion, but I know that I won't get it. I'll pray for, 
for my parents, but I know that they're a lost cause. I'll pray for my spouse, but I know that it's just not going to get any better between us. And God's, God's saying, you know, pray and, and believe what you're praying, that there's nothing too hard for God. And so we don't pray with an unbelieving spirit, but we pray with a confidence that we have in a father that has good things for us and that can do all things. We don't pray with improper motives. James 4, 3 says, you ask but do not receive because you ask wrongly, spend it on your passions. Lord, let me win the lottery. And I will give you 10% and that church will be doing so much for the kingdom. But you're going to buy that boat and you're going to buy that vacation house and you're going to do all those things. And in reality, you're asking to win the lottery to, to build your kingdom, not God's. So we're not gonna, he's not going to answer prayers with improper motives. And then he's not going to answer prayers that have no effort, which is really the opposite of the ask, seek, and knock. James 5.17 says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Prayed fervently. When was the last time we prayed fervently for something? not repetitive prayers that we can say without even thinking or going through the motions, but something that is just gut-wrenching. If it means something to you, we got to understand it means something to God. So pray fervently. What does your prayer life show God how urgent those things that you're asking for really are? So we got to understand that we ask and it'll be given. And then we seek. And that's putting our prayer in action. We're seeking after answers to prayer. We're seeking how God is working in our life. We're, we're, we're not being idle. We're seeking after him. And there's different ways that we can actually seek after him. And, and the first way, and the most important way, I believe, is, is actually seeking him in scripture. There's a lot of answers to your prayers in this book. But you got to open it in order to get those answers. Psalm 119.105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You could find the answers you're looking for in this book. We're not just praying and being idle. This is a living word. This is a living document. So we can go and we're going to search out the answers to our prayers. We're not just going to pray and then hope and be idle. But we're going to seek and look, how is God working in my life? How is God answering prayer in my life? What, in what ways is God moving in my life? And I'm looking and I'm seeking and trying to find that. Another way you can do that is actually go to mature believers that, that you trust and that you respect and that you honor. And, and God will speak through other people. Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Go to people that you trust. Go to people that you know that are connected to the Lord and ask them their opinions and, and God will speak through other people. So there's a lot of ways that we can do, we can seek after God. And sometimes when we don't know what to pray and we don't know what to ask and we don't know how to find the answer, we gotta remember that we have the living God, the Holy Spirit inside us who's interceding with us and interceding for us with groanings too deep for words, that, that, that those prayers will, can get answered through the Holy Spirit in our lives as well. So we ask, and we seek, and then we knock, which means we're persistent, that we don't give up. And this was convicting to me as I was going through this message, because I have family members that don't know the Lord, I have friends that don't know the Lord. I have things that, that I'd like to see in my life. And, and honest, honestly, after a while, I just seem to lose steam on those things. But, but the Bible says to, to keep knocking, 
Keep knocking, keep knocking, and the door will be open to you. We're going to be persistent. And we're going to show God how important these things are to us. And God will answer that door, and he'll open that door for you. And I know he will because I believe what this book says. But why does God do this? Why does God have us ask and seek and knock? I think he does that because he wants the very best for us. He wants to give us good things. God is a giver of good things. And he wants us to seek after him. And he wants, he wants us to go towards him. And he wants us to ask and seek and knock because he has things for us that are so good that, that, that and they're for us. But we just have to go and, and ask him for it. Seek and, and knock. The thing is, is, is that he wants those good things for us. Then the question we have to ask ourselves is, there's any area in my life that would suffer if I prayed more? Is there any area in my life that would suffer if I prayed more? Would I be a worse father if I prayed more? Or a worse husband? Would I be a less effective pastor if I prayed more? Would this church be less effective for the kingdom if I prayed more? The answer is no. There is nothing in my life that would suffer if I prayed more. And again, this isn't a works thing where I have to pray more, I have to put a certain amount of time in and I have to do this to earn God's favor. No, I'm praying more because I have a God that loves me, that cares for me, and I have a desire to seek him and he has the answers to all my questions. There is nothing in my life that would suffer if I prayed more. But the thing is, is that God knows he has all the answers. We know God has all the answers. But we also have an enemy that knows that God has all the answers. And he's going to try to keep you from asking and try to keep you from seeking and try to keep you from knocking because he knows the danger of being that close to God. I'm reading this book called, I'm, I'm a little late in the game, it's an old book called The Screw Tape Letters. And uh, it really is about, it's a, it's a fiction book, but it's, it's excellent it's by a Christian author, C.S. Lewis. Uh, some of you probably have read the book, but it's about a nephew a demon, really, um, tormenting a person that he is assigned to, trying to keep him from God, trying to keep him away from God, and, and trying to keep him from, from accepting Jesus as, as a personal Lord and Savior. But once this person does, then, okay, so now what are we going to do to wreck his life and get him separated from God? And so this book really is is letters from the uncle to the nephew educating this demon how to torment this guy. And it's a fascinating book. And, and so I was reading this this week, and, and I want to I read you a quote from from it, because it, it kind of goes along with, with this sermon here today, and it says this. This is a letter from the uncle to the, the nephew. The best thing where it is possible is to keep the patient, which we're the patients, keep the patient from the serious intention of praying altogether. Encourage him to remember the parrot-like nature of his prayers from childhood. That is exactly the sort of prayer we want superficial and lazy. It is funny how mortals always picture us putting things into their minds, but in reality, our best work is done by keeping things out. I believe that. We worry a lot about what the enemy puts in our minds, but what about what he's keeping out of our minds? What is it that, 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 that he's trying to keep out of our minds? And I believe the thing that the enemy works overtime to keep out of our minds is how good our God is. And when anything else is in our minds, then that, by default, is out. And, and our enemy works hard to keep the goodness of God out of our minds. And if the goodness of God is not in our minds, then the goodness of God is not in our hearts. Look at, this, look at the promises we have just in today's scripture alone. Just these five verses that we read in Matthew. And ask yourself, would the enemy want this for you? It will be given to you. You will find it. 
it will be opened for you. The asker receives, the seeker finds, the knocker gets an open door. Your father will give you good things. Jesus right here is showing us the heart of the father. Right here. God is not selfish. He's not stingy. He's a loving God who understands. He's a loving God that cares for you. He's a loving God that comforts you. And, 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 if, and if humans, as, as humans like us, are as, as flawed as we can be, can still be kind to other people, imagine how kind God can be, the creator of kindness. Enemy wants you away from all that. But we got to remember how good our God is. God will never give you anything that's bad for you. But we have to believe that. But not only will God not give you anything that's bad for you, he's often going to protect you from the things that you think is good. He's not going to give you a snake. Expect good things from God. And that's a key thing that we need to understand here is we need to expect good things from God. What, when you think of God, what do you expect? Do you expect good things or do you expect punishment? Do you expect shame? Do you expect judgment? Knowing the goodness of God will bring the peace in your life that you have been longing for for a very, very long time that peace that you've been chasing over and over and you're buying new things and you're buying stuff and you're going on vacations and you're medicating, you're doing all of these things to try to find peace. All you need to know is how good your God is. That's it. And one of Satan's most effective strategies is to plant those lies in your heart so you don't know those truths. Because when you believe a lie, that becomes truth to you. God's not going to answer that prayer. God is mad at you. That's why he's not answering you right now. Because of your past, because of what you did 10 years ago, 15 years ago, he's not answering you today because he's punishing you for what you did back then. Shame on you. You're not gonna, he's not going to hear you. He's mad at you. God doesn't love you. And we think these things. We've all been there sometime. But how long do we let that linger is the key. Because if, it, if we actually believe that, then what happens? We stop asking. And we stop seeking. And we stop knocking. How tragic is it for someone to stop praying to God because he doesn't believe that he's worthy. It's tragic to believe that, that I'm being punished, so I might as well not even approach God. Or even worse, to actually still go through the motions of prayer but not really believe you're going to get any answers. We have to believe the goodness of God above anything else, above anything else, how good God is. And, and, and we, we can expect good things and we know good things and we can ask in confidence when we actually trust God. And when we trust God is when we believe the, the, the things that are written in this book are true and not only for everybody else, but for you too. This book is, is packed with promises for you to have because we have such a good God. And knowing that that's true for you is, is knowing how much you are loved. And you are loved so much because Jesus died so you can have a relationship with a good father. That is the gift for you. And we need to be confident in that. And, and it's nothing that we deserve. It's nothing that we earn. It was just a gift for us because we are so loved. And the death of Jesus on the, in the cross is the foundation of all the promises found in Scripture. That's why we end so many prayers with, in Jesus' name. Because everything, everything depends on him. Everything depends on the cross. And, and the reason why we can trust in the goodness of God is because we are his children. 
We are his kids. Think about your kids and how much you love them. God will give you good things as your children because he's already given you the gift to become his children. And But the good thing is, is that the goodness of God doesn't stop at that. It continues over and over and over again. Jesus died so we could become children of God. And the truth is, in this world, and we all know this, people are going to let you down. Family members are going to let you down. I'm going to let you down. The church is going to let you down. You're going to let the church down. You're going to let family members down. You're, people are going to let you down. You're going to let yourself down. But God never will. God never will. And he is there to give you good things. And that you, you didn't get the job that you wanted. Why? You needed a job. and you th- Well, maybe God didn't give it to you because he understands that you're going to work more, too many hours and, and you're going to put so much effort and, and, and time and, and energy into that job that, that your family is going to be neglected and it's going to be a hardship for your family. That job that you think that you absolutely have to have is a snake for you so he didn't give it to you. Do you trust that? Why can't I date this guy? I want to date this guy. And, I, you know, and all my friends are, are married or have boyfriends. And I just want to date this guy. No, you can't date the guy. He's a snake. <laughs> but I want to date this girl. She's nice and she's, she goes to church. Or no, she's a snake. There's a lot of evil behind that makeup. You cannot date this girl. <laughs> Sometimes God protects us. That's how good our God is. That's why we answer our prayers with your will be done. Because it's always better to be in the will of God than to be the will of self. You know how much God loves you? I caught that and didn't break an iPad. That's good. Now now it's all ruined. Ah, well. You know how much God loves you? He didn't answer Jesus' prayer in the garden. Take this cup from me. That would have been snakes for everyone here. But Jesus says, but not my will, but your will be done. That's how much God loves you. That's how much Jesus loves you. Be willing to go to the cross and go through the suffer and the torture and the murder that he had to endure. And people are killing him. And he says, forgive them. That's how much God loves you. Now my notes are gone for sure. You know how else God loves you? This whole ask, seek, knock thing. Let's look at Romans 8.34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. That's a picture of the love of God right there. Jesus says, ask, seek, knock. But you have your Savior, the right hand of God, doing that for you. That's how much you're loved. That's how much God loves you. That's why you can trust him with everything. And you don't have to hope. You expect good things from God because he, sa- he shows you how much he loves you. Translation is Jesus died for you. He gives you access to heaven for someone who loves you, gives you good things, including the promises of today. And above all else is doing that for you, which means one thing. For those of you that are here that don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Now there's only one option. And that is to get introduced today. That's the only option. All this goodness, all this favor, all this kindness, an eternity in heaven waiting for you instead of eternity of separation from God. All of this is for you and all you have to do is say yes. That's for you today. But what about the rest of us who who has accepted Jesus as our Lord and and Savior? What does that mean for us? Well, it means two things. 
we have a decision to make. And we could do one of two things. One, we can know about God. And we can know a lot of facts and a lot of things. And we can talk to a lot of people. And we can sound real intelligent and know everything there is to know about God. And we can even go through the motions of asking and seeking and knocking and going to church and joining a small group and doing all these things because we're going to earn God's favor. But then what happens is we know all about God and then we ask, seek, and knock, and then we, we hope God's going to answer. And we do it out of duty and obedience. Or we can truly understand and accept how good God is and we go from here to here. And we don't know just about God. We know God. And we don't have to, to go and ask and seek and knock out of obedience and duty. We do it because out of desire. We have a desire to be with him. We have a desire to go to him. We have desire to, to be in a relationship with. See, the first one's religion. You can know all these facts and everything, and you can go through the motions and do all the good Christian stuff and not have a relationship with God. Jesus died so you can have a relationship with a God who is absolutely crazy about you. That's when you go from here, religion, to here, relationship. And you go through all the motions as the first person, but you do it because you have a desire to do it. And that you want to. 